Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond. This is episode number 768 for May 27th, 2023. And I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week, our guest is Bart Bouchats with Programming by Stealth, installment 151. Not quite the ring of 150, but uh, we're marching on. Well, you could argue it's 152-ish. <laughs> What's 152? Is that something? Well, no, it's a rounder number. <laughs> Okay, you're just being silly now. Well, what are we going to do this week, Bart? Uh, we are going to have a slight change of plan because our listeners rock. So mm. we 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 had, I think, an excellent episode last time, all about redirecting the various POSIX streams. Um, I'm really happy we, we redid it. Um, oh, yeah. And I got a lovely message from listener Jill of Kent, who is very insistent the of Kent be added, since there are now two amazing listener Jills. And so we need to be sure we credit the right listener Jill. Uh, That's right, right. So we talked about the fact that slash dev slash TTY represents the terminal. And we also said, unfortunately correctly, that you can't tell if there is or isn't something waiting for you in standard in in a cross-platform way. You can do it in bash 5, which means it won't work on the Mac, but you can't do it cross-platform. And that remains true, unfortunately. But Jill did have a fantastic little tip. so. If you remember back to when we did, when we first met conditionals, we learned about the square bracket, square bracket built in function for doing, for evaluating a Boolean. And I mentioned that, you know, there were commonly used operators like minus F for is it a file and um, minus E for does it exist and minus, uh, I think it's D for is it a directory. And I said, there's loads more, but you don't need the other ones. We'll just stick to the more important ones. There's one which has just become interesting. Minus T okay. can tell you whether or not a stream is the terminal. Ooh, are we going to learn about that this week? We are. I'm sorry, getting ahead of myself every day. I'm going to hear, yeah, yes, I'll save my powder. Yes. <laughs> that was me turning Bart back to the order of the show notes. <laughs> yes. So then we are going to do the first half of what I had actually promised to do today, which is printf. And mm -hmm. printf is a fantastic life scale. I'm going to make the argument that printf is a life scale, a bit like regular expressions. So Perl gave the world regular expressions. You know how to write regular expressions. You don't know how to write a line of Perl. But kind of you do, because the regular expression syntax you know is from Perl. Well, the C programming language gifted the world a very common way of representing format strings. And Bash just took them wholesale. So yeah, OK, why reinvent the wheel? We'll just take printf from C. PHP stole it from C, Java stole it from C, lots and lots of languages stole it from C. So once you learn printf here for us in Bash, you now have a life skill that will actually, you'll notice it cropping up all over the place. Now oh, that cool. Once you recognize it, so we're going to, you know, we're going to have lots of fun with that. Uh, but of course, we have some homework to do before we do anything else. So I guess that's where we should get kicked in. So... We have been playing around with a little script to read a menu. Initially, it was from a text file, present you with a list of options, ask you to enter your order, and then tell you what you ordered. And when last we left, uh, our, left our, our little script, I had asked you to update it so that it would default to reading the menu from a file named menu.txt in the same folder as the script. But if you wanted to use a different file, you could use the minus M optional parameter to specify a file name. Or if you would like to read from standard in, then you could use minus M space minus to say, actually, I'd like you to read the menu from standard in. Um, and then I did say that we had added a minus S for snark flag last time. And I told you, if you want to make your code a bit smaller, you can lose the snark. And you said no. So you're fine. Your snark stayed. <laughs> Mine went away because I wanted to have my sample solution Basically, I wanted the important things for this week to not be cluttered, so I felt it was better for clarity that I remove it, even if you didn't. And then the other thing let was... Me, I, let me hold you for one quick second here. No, you did say that. I misinterpreted something. Okay, I now understand the assignment better. All right. Okay, and then the last thing I said was to make sure that no matter which way the pipes are flowing, I always wanted the interaction with the user to be through the terminal. So whether or not there's a menu being piped into standard in, when it comes to asking the user for their order, they should always be asked from the terminal, from the keyboard, not from standard in, which would be what happened by default. So you had a little bit of work to do to read and write to the terminal explicitly. 
which is the last thing we learned in the previous installment. All right. So basically, you will find the full solution, as always, in the installment zip, pbs150-challengesolution.sh. I am so boring in my naming convention, but hey, I'll call it No, that's turned out to be very handy because uh, Ed Howland is organizing your solutions into the PBS student challenges. So we all have our own little folders in our uh, organization for PBS, and we created one for you, and he's populating it, and he's depending on you to keep consistent with that naming convention. Well, it's a good thing I'm a so very boring person. Stay <laughs> boring. No, no, you're consistent and, and reliable and repeatable. That is not boring. That is what you really want. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, I will keep doing it now. That's good to know. Um, yeah. So... I'm going to draw your attention to a few things, but the full solution is sitting in the zip file. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to is the use of slash dev slash TTY, which is the special file that represents the terminal. And so whenever we need to send a message that will always go to the terminal, like please enter your order, we need to redirect standard out to slash dev slash TTY. So that way, no matter whether or not the order is being piped into a file or piped over to WC minus L to count the lines, or no matter what you're doing with the plumbing, you always want to ask the user in the terminal what you want to eat. So therefore, we need to print all of those messages to the terminal. Therefore, we, op we use the greater than sign slash dev slash TTY after the echo statements to make sure we're printing to the terminal. So I'm going to stop you because I think it's possible I will never understand this. I know I've been through PBS 150 an entire twice, um, <laughs> and I looked at the homework, but I didn't come close to figuring out what I was supposed to do with slash dev slash DTY. Um, I'm, I'm confused because we always saw the menu in the terminal, and we always saw the output in the terminal. Because so it was what, going to standard did, error. Right. So if you but pipe, you just said we have to put echo to greater than slash dev slash dty to be able to see it. Well, to be able to always see it. Because if you redirect standard error to dev null, then all of a sudden your menu goes away. So how would it get sent to dev null? How well, would it, or, user, how would it standard? The person calling your script is free to redirect anything to standard in and it's, they're free to redirect standard out or standard error anywhere, and you have no control as a script author, right? That is how your script is used. That happens at use time. So do you want your script to always behave no matter how it's being used, is the question. Yeah, I guess this is where our silly example makes me not even think of that as an option. Like, why would anybody ask for a menu and not want to be able to see it. Why would they ever do that? That, I, that would have never occurred to me, but this is, this is just a silly example, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm trying to make the line so that it's silly and fun. And, uh, and no, so, no, it's, yeah. th that's good. That's good, though. But, but that, that's opening me up to someone might tell it. So in, in, I don't think in your examples, actually, do you go through and say to send it to dev null and prove that it still comes out? Uh, I don't do dev null to prove it still comes out, but I do actually in the example pipe the actual output of what you ordered to a text file to prove that we actually have what we want, which is the interaction is through the key is through the terminal. And the only thing that ends up in the transcript file is your order. So the conversation with you about your order doesn't oh. go to standard out, but what you ordered does go to standard out. So it can be redirected. Therefore, the script behaves very, very friendly with pipes. Okay, maybe we should keep going through this, and I'll and I'll understand that when you get there. Okay, so we took the echoes and we we uh, greater than symbol them into dev uh, slash dev slash dty. Yes, to make sure that no matter what, the echo statements would always be printed to the to the screen. Yes, which is the echo statement to say please choose your order, and the echo statement to say you have just or added whatever to your order. So the the two echo statements relating to taking your order. The other thing we okay. have to do is make sure that the select statement is interacting with the terminal because the select statement by default will read your answers from standard in, which could be a menu, mm -hmm. which would confuse the ever, you know, which would really make a mess if it tried to use your menu as its options. Right. If you said minus M space minus and standard in has just been used as the menu. So how can it be used now to take option one, option two, option three? It, can't. Okay. So we need to okay. make sure that the select statement always reads from the terminal. So that means we need to redirect the terminal into the select. 
which means that after okay. the done, we have a less than sign, dev tty. The done in the done in the select you're talking about? The done that ends the select. So the end of the select okay. is the done keyword. So right. when I say at the end of the select, that is that is where it goes. It's a little confusing, but hey, that's bash. That was the rules. <laughs> Well, that's where we were shoving a file in before. It is. So yeah, correct, actually, yes. Now yeah. we're just doing dev, slash dev slash tty. Yes. Okay, and that doesn't keep us from shoving in menu.txt. No, because that's going to be sitting or in the, standard in, which we're going to have used right. elsewhere that I'm going to talk to you about in a moment. Okay. Okay. So we're saying that no matter what happens, when the select menu comes up saying, what would you like to eat? Your, your answer is always coming from the keyboard. Doesn't matter okay. what else has got, been got, done. Okay. Yeah, you're guaranteeing okay. it. And we also need to guarantee that when it asks us, you know, when it shows us the list of options, it should be showing those to the terminal always. So the select statement also has to be told, you always talk to the terminal. So after the done, we also have a greater than slash dev slash tty. So after the okay. done, we have two redirections because we need standard in and standard out to be plumbed to the terminal for the select statement. Gotcha. And that then works. So that is that is the first piece of important change. Uh, and then the next thing is, how do we load the menu? So in the past, we just sort of read the menu from the file, and that was, that was a very straightforward. We always just read it from the file. But now we actually have a little bit of logic to apply. And so I decided that the easiest way to apply logic was to default, so to set a variable at the top of my script, uh, to default it to taking the menu from the txt file. So I have menu source becomes equal to dir, you know, dollar dear name bash source slash menu.txt, which is the file menu.txt in the same folder as the script. So we learned about that. So that times. was the thing that we used to shove in, but now you're putting it into a variable so you can use it. Yeah, so it's a variable that now okay. has a default value of what, you know, what I basically said was if they don't tell me anything else, I'm going to assume this. So let's actually just make gotcha. that assumption into a variable assignment. And then okay. we then later on down the script need to actually slurp in. I probably should have included in the little snippets also. So in my, uh, in my uh, get opts, I obviously added uh, an M for the minus M optional argument. And whatever you mm -hmm. pass to minus M gets stored into menu source. So in other words, menu source defaults to menu.txt, but if you pass a minus M, then whatever you pass is now in menu source. So then when it comes to reading the menu, I can basically say, well, my menu string, I'm going to default it to an empty string. So menu string becomes equal to single quote, single quote. And then I say, if my menu source is equal to the minus symbol, then we want to slurp standard in, which we can do with just dollar cat. Otherwise, I want to read from whatever file is in menu source. It'll either be my menu.txt default or whatever was passed with the minus M. So then I say menu string becomes equal to dollar cat menu source. I thought that it was minus, that it was minus M and then minus as two separate things we were supposed to do. And so I didn't catch that part of the assignment. I went back and double checked. And yes, you were very clear in your instructions that that's what you said to do. But I don't understand how the minus M and the minus still go together. I still don't get it. I abstract it back. So if I add a parameter named L and I expect you to pass me a length, then there are two arguments, minus L and then four, or minus L and then 22. Right, it's minus name of parameter value. So minus m space value. And the value can either be minus or the value can be a file name. But it's Okay, so if the if the value is a file name, I I understand what it does, and you're saying if it's if it's minus, then it's gonna scat whatever text string Standard you shoved in. in at the front which yes. is standard in? Yes. Okay. So I tested your code by just saying, uh, you know, dot slash the, the, the shell uh, script name space minus, and it goes out and it gets the, uh, the menu.txt file. Correct, because you passed it an, 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 an unnamed argument, which the script completely ignores. So $1 contains okay. the value minus. Okay. 
And my script okay, is nothing. Because it only knows what minus is if it was preceded by the, the uh, optional argument minus M. Okay. Okay. It, it, the fact that it ignored it made me think it was doing something different than what it was doing. Yeah, so it's just, it is just $1 if it doesn't have, if it didn't name it, it's just $1. Okay. Okay. I think I've caught up. Okay. All right, uh, so where was I? We've done that bit. Um, okay. And we've done that bit. Uh, so then once we have our menu in a string, then we can loop through it as if it was coming from a file. So the triple arrow is our here string, which is how we read a string into standard in. So triple arrow, bleh, bleh, triple arrow, triple arrow, triple arrow is some sort of very soft flower. Um, tri triple arrow dollar menu string will read the value of that variable as standard in. So we can use that in our while loop to just process our menu. It doesn't really matter where it came from now because we've shoved it into the variable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That part I understood. Yeah, and that, that saved me duplicating my code because I don't like duplicating code. That makes me cranky. It is a bad smell. So at this stage, we can verify that the code does what I think. So you will find in the zip file an extra file called menu montypythontxt which offers a shockingly interesting menu. It contains one item and one item only. Spam. <laughs> and I suppose you could have made 10 items and they're all spam. Spam. I could have, or I could have had spam, egg, bacon, and spam. <laughs> there you go. I did, uh, I did try to be clever with mine, even though I stole mostly copied off your paper. I made mine uh, called twitter.txt, and Ooh. all it had in it was a poop emoji. <laughs> oh, that's too good. For anyone who doesn't know, that's what uh, Apple, or what, ooh, not Apple, uh, that's what Twitter PR responds with if you write to it is a poop emoji. So then I got excited and I made a fail whale and then I made a rocket with an explosion thing. So, <laughs> you know, at least I had three to test with. Oh, that's great fun. And of course you can even use emoji anywhere because they're just UTF-8. It's great. Yeah, I thought you'd be excited that I used some emoji. I do like that. Even um, though I totally copied off your paper. Hey, it's all about learning. Um, mm -hmm. You can learn off someone else in the class. That's fine. Uh, so we can call a script with minus m space menu dash Monty Python .txt and it will let us choose our spam. Uh, or we can echo bacon, new line eggs, new line toast, pipe that into our script and then call our script with minus m minus and then redirect to order.txt. And that proves the whole thing in, out because now what happens is standard in is now bacon, eggs, toast, which we're going to read as the menu. And yet, even though standard in is used, when it comes up to ask you what you'd like to eat, you're still getting the menu options like you should mm -hmm. when you're typing stuff in and it's still interacting with you perfectly. And then when you're finished, it doesn't tell you your order because that's been redirected to order.txt. But if you have a look in order.txt, it contains only what you ordered and not the chit chatter you had to make your order. I have a very important question on this one. Oh. When I ran this command, it showed me four options, not just bacon, eggs, and toast. One of the options was done. Where did Correct. done come from? Okay, so if you look at, the, where's the loop? Um, wherever the select loop is, mm -hmm. yeah, where is the select loop? So the select loop, uh, I do I have select it in Select items my copy in done. Yes, as in there is an option. So that, go ahead. Yeah, so the select loop takes, you know, whatever in and then a list of things. So my first thing in the list is just done, followed by the explosion of my array. So that means that as far as the select statement is concerned, it has done and then whatever the array exploded into. Ah, good. Okay. You're, you're working down my list of questions. You got three down. Ooh. <laughs> oh, not even halfway. Go me. Okay, so that is the sample solution. Um, I hope that uh, works. Well, no, I know it works. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> so now, now I get to go to, to, to saying nice things about Jill of Kent. Um, so wh where we had left off is that we unfortunately can't tell whether or not there is something in, uh, in any particular stream, actually, for waiting for us to read it. So we can't avoid blocking... Uh, yeah, we talked about this last time. Let's not re rehash that. 
we can detect whether or not any stream is the terminal. And this is something that's perplexed me for a while because there's a whole bunch of terminal commands that appear to do magic. And whenever something appears to do magic, I know it's not magic. It's something Bart doesn't know. Well, Bart now does know how this is done. So you may have noticed that the git commands are an example of this. The git command, if you say git log, it will list every single git commit in a repo. So for PBS, the git log is quite long. We have done a lot of commits. Mm -hmm. And if you do it on the terminal, it will pass it through less and it will stop you after every page and wait for you to hit the space bar. But if you take that same yes. thing and pipe it to a file, all of it just goes into the file. There was no one hitting a space bar there. So it knew if I'm talking to the terminal, I will do one behavior. But if I'm not talking to the terminal, I will do a different behavior. Okay. So how does it know whether or not it's talking to the terminal? How did it know whether or not it was being piped? And the answer is because of this minus T test for inside our square bracket, square bracket operator. So if you say we minus... Didn't do it. We didn't type a minus T. We didn't type any square brackets. Okay. We if we want our script log. to be able to work in the same intelligent way as the git commands, then in our script, we can detect whether or not something is the terminal okay. by writing... Okay. By writing an if statement to say, basically, if we detect that we that that something is the terminal, do one thing, else do another thing. So that is how okay. Git okay. is doing it. Okay. So the minus T operator takes just one argument on its right, which is a number, which is the identifier of the file handle. So zero for standard in, one for standard out, and two for standard error. So if you say if square bracket, square bracket, minus T zero, then you know that you whatever code for if t, if standard in is a terminal, else whatever code for when standard in is not a terminal. So I have a wonderfully exciting script called PBS 151A dash terminal tester.sh, which just has three if statements. If minus T zero, then echo standard in is a terminal, else echo standard in is not a terminal. And in both cases, I am explicitly doing my echoes to slash dev slash TTY because I know I'm about to start messing around with my streams. So I want this script to always tell the terminal what's going on, because otherwise, if I'm doing redirections, I'll lose my output. So I'm OK, being, I have another one putting greater than slash dev slash TTY on the end of every echo statement. Well, no, because then anything you do that to can't be piped into a file. So we're only doing that when you want to be absolutely certain it's going to a terminal. If you do that all the time, people are going to be really cranky at you because then your script can't be saved to a, the output of your script can't be saved to a file. OK, OK. All right. Uh, so I, I, the same if statement basically three times for T for minus T zero, minus T one and minus T two with standard in, standard out and standard error. So if you try okay. that at the terminal, if you just run the script with without any piping, it will tell you that all three of them are the terminal, which is the default, right? Standard in is the terminal, standard out is the terminal, standard error is the terminal. If so you, you then, did that by just, just running the script with no arguments? Yes, and in particular, okay. no redirections is, is what matters here, because the script, the script ignores arguments. But the important thing is there are no, there's no, there's no terminal plumbing. It's, we're just running the script. If we do a bit of terminal plumbing, so if we say echo pancakes pipe and then send that to our script, now standard in contains pancakes. It's not connected to the terminal, it's connected to the other side of the pipe. So now when we run it, we will see that it says that standard in is not the terminal. Okay, even though we just finished typing echo space quote pancakes unquote with the terminal, it's saying it's not coming from the terminal. Correct, because standard in is not connected to your keyboard. If you read from standard in, you are going to read pancakes. You're going to read the output of the echo command. Remember, the pipe symbol... I just can... typed it with my, my... I typed it in the terminal with the keyboard. That's how it got there. How is that? That's how it from got the there. That's not where it is. So remember, the pipe connects two commands together. So the echo command we typed... Oh, okay. And the echo okay, command got you, outputted got you. pancakes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, to standard in. Got you. Okay. To standard out. Okay. It outputted the standard out. 
and then the pipe symbol took standard but out. It came standard in, I mean, to the to the script. Yes, exactly. And plumbed okay. the standard in on the script. So the script is seeing standard in as being the output of a pipe, which contains pancakes, okay. which it's going to ignore, but it's just going to tell us, no, that's not a terminal. I'm plumbed into something. Okay. Uh, if we redirect standard out to dev null by saying name of script forward slash slash dev slash null, it will tell us that standard out has now been redirected. If we redirect standard error. So it's error, not a terminal. It is not a terminal because it is dev null. Okay. If we do two greater than sign dev null, then we're redirecting standard error to dev null. It will then tell us that, dev, that standard error is not a terminal. Or we can go for the full whack and we can echo pancakes, pipe it into the script, arrow dev null, and then send two arrow ampersand one. So arrow dev null says take standard out and make it be dev null. And then the two greater than two greater than ampersand one says take take standard error and make it standard out. Standard out is already dev null. So what we're saying there is make standard error be dev null as well. So now nothing is the terminal. Okay. Now I I get why it was useful to have git log go to less so we could hit the space bar and, and the man pages do the same thing. Mm. Um, but why, what are the, what are the use cases that you see for this that you wish you had known before? Uh, well, to, to, automatic paging is probably the most common use case. You will see that used okay. in a whole bunch of the standard red, uh, in fact, the system D commands that Red Hat uses for managing stuff. Another place that's used by Git as well as by a lot of modern commands is you can make the terminal do pretty colors by adding in really weird escape characters. Hmm. And you don't want those escape characters ending up in your output if you pipe it somewhere. Like you really don't okay. want square brackets, squiggly, whatever ending up. They're really horrible escape okay. characters. So when you see a command like git, which uses colors to show you what, what is, what's new and stuff, mm -hmm. if you pipe that git command to a file, the color's gone. Again, it's detecting whether or not it's on a terminal, and it's only giving you color if it's on a terminal. If, on if terminal. it's not on a terminal, it doesn't fill your output with glop. So how would we use any of these uh, minus T0, minus T1, minus T2 for the three different um, standards? How would we use it to make it go to less? Well, so you could say if not, obviously you'd want to invert. So, uh, so you might have a variable that contains your output call it dollar my okay. stuff so you'd say okay. if minus t1 standard out if standard out is mm -hmm. a terminal we say less space sorry we take echo whatever pipe less so echo dollar the output pipe less else echo dollar the output fee okay how would it be going somewhere other than the terminal we would have had to have code that was saying to do something else with it under not, certain not circumstances. Not code. No, no, remember, it's about how the script is used. So if you write this script and someone puts a greater than sign myoutput.txt, then your script okay. will respond by having a different branch of that if statement. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay. So it's about how That's your script fun. is used. Yes. So your script is detecting at runtime what's a, what's what's around me you know your, your script is aware of its surroundings or you can make your script behave differently depending on how it was called so, all right yeah. very fun it is very thank fun, you jill of kent i was very pleased very pleased okay <laughs> so now we're going to move into conceptually less confusing territory we are going to make our string outputs nicer at the moment, when I have outputted a variable as part of our output, we've just said echo, and then we've used an interpolated quote, so a double quote, and then we just put the name of the variable inside, you know, in there with a dollar sign in front of it. And it's taken whatever was there and just splatted it into the middle of the string and outputted it, which is fine a lot of the time, but maybe we want a teensy weensy bit more control. Like maybe we want to always round it up to having two decimal places, or maybe we want to always pad out a string so that they line up nicely, or there's all sorts of things you want to do to format output more than just splat the variable completely unchanged straight into the output, which is all we can do with echo. And 
That is why printf, which stands for print formatted, that's why that C function was written. And C, the C language was basically written to write Unix. So it's probably not a surprise that the shell scripts inherited from C, given that you know, C lives in, that's where C, uh, sorry, the, the bash lives in the same place, right? It's a Unixy thing. And like I said before, printf has made its way all over the place. It's become one of those de facto standards. If I want to do string formatting, we'll do it that way. I know Objective-C has it. Do you remember there was a nasty bug with Apple's routers that if you named your Wi-Fi network something with a percentage sign in it, your network oh, exploded. Yeah. That was yeah. printf. Yeah. Because the special character to say this is something special in a printf is percent. Oh. <laughs> so you, you will recognize it. So it him. really did leak in somewhere. Yeah. It really did leak in somewhere. So the printf command is kind of fun. It's really, really easy to just get going with it. But it's really, really powerful, so it will probably take you the entirety of the rest of your life to learn everything. But it's fine, mm. because no one person needs everything. So you can learn what you need 90% of the time really quickly, and if you need to learn something else, you can do a quick Google, and you will very quickly find the format string to do the weirdo thing you needed to do, and you can pop it in. So we're just going to... do a spoiler here. I have read ahead, and I think this is really fun. I, I, I imagine you're going to have way too much fun with the, the bits where you're formatting tables. I, I can just see you having way too much fun with that. Um, yep, I was already experimenting. <laughs> good, 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 good. That is what I want. Um, so we're going to focus on just the bits I think are important. And if you ever need more, know that there is more. And then, you know, at this stage, we're 150 something episodes in. So at this stage, I'm hoping people are, ha are comfortable ending up on Stack Overflow and having a read. Or yeah, pop it open yeah, the documentation absolutely. and having a read. So the basic structure for the printf command is printf. The first argument is the format string. So this is... What is a format string? Because you don't define about. that in the show notes. That was question number four. You never say what a format string is. Um, okay, I, I, guess I, need to ref I guess I need to rephrase my show notes. I do actually have a title. Uh, printf format strings is a h2. But I guess... I guess that isn't clear enough. No, it, it says better string formatting with printf. Yeah, that's the H1. But, but it, I, I even checked with Dorothy to see if you had already told me this so that you wouldn't say, Allison, I already told you what a format string was. So tell us, Bart, what is a format string? Well, I'm actually going to put you on pause on that. I promise you it's coming one page down in the scrolly bar. Um, so you but, can't use the phrase until you get to that then. Well, no, but I need to tell you what the arguments are. I need to, here is the landscape, right? This is, a, this is a country. It has a couple of cities. We'll look at each city in a moment. So the printf command, the first argument is this very important format string, which is going to take up most of our time today. And then after that are zero or more additional arguments. And so the format string contains placeholders. And the additional arguments are the values that are going to get shoved into those placeholders. So if your format string contains four placeholders, you need to have four more arguments to give you the four values for your placeholders. Okay, it's funny that they define those new, that new terminology that's annoying that because you could have called them variables, but they're not called variables. Well, they're val that they're... If it's something that has a symbol and you've got a value you're going to shove into it, that's a variable. It's just another name for it, but I don't know why they didn't But do it's that. inside but, okay. a string. So if you use the word variable, people get really confused because it's inside a string. So it, it, You put variables inside strings all the time with dollar parentheses, the variable Right, but name. that's a bash thing. This is not a bash thing. As far as bash is concerned, a format string is just an ordinary string that contains the percentage sign. It's only the printf function that takes that ordinary bash string and the printf function is doing the magic. So from bash's point of view, they are absolutely not variables. They are just the percentage sign and then another character. Hmm. Okay. It's a subtlety, right? But the printf function is where the magic happens. So the printf function takes as its first argument, a string. And then whatever amount of extra arguments you need to fill up all the placeholders in that string. And that will depend entirely on what you're trying to achieve. So the number of arguments will vary over time. By default, printf writes to standard out. 
So you can use it in place of echo. You can just substitute in printfs instead of echoes. But what if you actually want to take three or four pieces of information, format them nicely, but save it to a variable? I mean, that is not an unreasonable thing to want to do. So printf does support that with a named optional argument, v for variable, I guess. So you can say printf space minus v space name of variable, then your format string, and then whatever values you want to shove into that format string. And then instead of the output going to standard out, it goes into the variable. Okay. So... We can, as I say, there's examples in the show. So the first example is a very basic printf. So printf, the first argument is the string i space like space two space have percent s space percent d space times a week exclamation point new line character. And then we pass a second argument of pancakes and a third argument of five. And when you run that, it says, I like to have pancakes five times a week because the percent %s is our first placeholder and that becomes pancakes. And the percent %d is our second placeholder, which becomes five. And again, we'll look at why they're s and d in a moment, but the basic structure is printf string value value. So far, so good? Yeah, I want you to tell me what a format string is pretty soon. You're yeah, using two examples lines. of it now. Two lines. That, that apparently was a format string that you just read to us. Correct. It was, yes. Yes. Um, I, I, we have another example serving into a variable dessert, and then we can echo our variable dessert, and you can see that and instead of it going to the screen, our, our formatted string was saved into the variable. So... Yeah, it, reading this, it makes perfect sense. It's really simple syntax. <laughs> Devilishly simple it, is the phrase I'm going to use. Yeah. So, oh, because it's a single digit, yeah, and a, and a single string, and we're not doing any, we're not doing any, we're not doing anything clever with it, right? We're just taking a simple value and shoving it out. So, the format string, that first argument, that is where the power and the complexity are are hiding in plain sight. So, really, for the rest of this installment, we are going to talk about those format strings, right? So, at first. What's a format string, Bert? Is the word is the quote I like to have percent s percent d times a week unquote? Is that the format string? Yes, the first argument is the format string. So, a format string is what? It is a string that contains these things I'm not allowed to call variables. Placeholders. Percent s and percent d. Placeholders. Yes. Okay, so any string that has those placeholders in it that are that come after a printf, that's what a format string is. Yes. Okay. It, it, yeah, so printf will, will treat whatever you give it as its first argument as the thing I'm supposed to transform. So printf... Okay, so it's... It, it, what was confusing me is I thought it, maybe the percent %s was the format string. That's no, so why I've been trying to get you to tell us what it is, because I, I didn't know which it was. It's the whole string that happens to contain those placeholders. Yes. So the first argument, okay. the whole first argument is the format string. Uh, no, it's not the first argument, because you've got printf minus v dessert. Okay, so the it. minus so v the dessert is an optional argument, which gets stripped away by optar by, 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 by optargs, argops. Ah, get ups. Jeez. Optarg. Get ups. Yeah. Right. So the first, okay. ar- so even there, the, when the minus v dessert is processed, the first actual argument is still the string. Right. Our optional argument is, is the minus v dessert. So the first real argument is still the format string. Even in both examples, the first argument is the format string. Hmm. Okay. You can have an optional argument that is not the first argument. <laughs> Which is how, okay, if I say to you that the first argument of ls is the folder you want to list, if you say ls minus l, you don't then say to me, well, no, Bart, the first argument is now minus l. If I say ls space minus l tilde, you're not going to argue with me that tilde isn't the first argument. I, I, I would have until you've just, apparently it's no. not. Optional arguments are not considered, you're saying because it's not dollar zero. Yes, exactly. Precisely. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. That makes yes. sense. Okay, so everything really from now on is about that string, right? It's all about that mm-hmm. string. And in that string, it, so that string is made up of three things, right? So 
inside that string, there are three possible things that can exist. There can be escape sequences. There can be format specifications, which is a terrible name I didn't make up. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm reading from the manual. I did. <laughs> Good, because I would have yelled at you because it doesn't make any sense. So it doesn't make any sense. Name, but okay. I, went to, I checked the manual to make sure I was using the right words, and I was using way sensibler words, and the manual told me, nope, they are format specifications. I abbreviated okay, the spec. Okay, so escape sequences, escape sequences, format specifications, and then what's the third thing? Plain text. If you're not one of those two, you're just text. And what the what printf does with just text is it just prints it. So unless you're an okay. escape sequence or a format spec, you're just going clean through. You're just getting whatever you are in, that's what you are out. So you just get past okay. it. So let's start with the escape sequences because they're easy. They start with a backslash. And then as far as we're concerned, there's only really three of them that matter to us. And there, there's... There's two of them that matter to us, and there's a third one we need to be aware of. So backslash n is for a new line, backslash t is for a tab. They are the two most important ones. And should you need to have a backslash in the actual output, then you have to do backslash backslash. Okay. Because otherwise it doesn't work. So I have a very, very silly example which shows that bash is actually quite clever in its printf. So if you're only using slash t and slash n, you can use an interpolated or an uninterpolated string, so single or double quotes, and it will work fine. So if you printf ho slash t ho slash n ho slash t hum slash n, or if you did the same thing in double quotes, it will print out ho tab ho new line Ho, tab, hum. And it will be properly lined up. And it will do it correctly. Which makes a lot more sense if you're looking at the text. I bet nobody could hear that, but I know what you mean because I'm looking at it. So it works fine whether you have double or single quotes, which is a relief. Because within a double quote, slash n actually does have a meaning as does slash t. But basically the printf is like, well, you've given me a literal tab. I'll interpret that the same as a backslash t and I'm happy. Oh, you give me a literal new line character. I'm happy with that. So it's fine with slash T and slash N in either type of string. That cannot be said about backslash backslash. If you want a backslash in a single quoted string, it's just backslash backslash. If you want a backslash in a double quoted string, the double quotes are going to interpret everything once. So backslash backslash gets collapsed to backslash. So if you want what gets as far as printf to be two backslashes, you need four of them to start with. <laughs> this does okay, not I'm never going to need a, back, a backslash. I'm, I'm going to make sure, no matter what happens, I'm never going to use one. Uh, my advice is always use a single quoted string and the off chance you need a backslash. Thankfully, they're rare. I think they're used as the escape sequence because they're rare. Like in, in life, you generally type the forward slash unless you're a Windows person. Right. Yeah, right, so, so. I, I don't know how you keep track of when single and double quotes. I, I, it's mysterious to me. If, I, if something's wrong with my code, I change it to the other one. I just start randomly going through single quotes and changing to doubles because I don't know. I can't keep track. I, I, I think need it's like a cheat Perl, sheet. Well, single quote means exactly this. Double quote means I'm going to have a think about it and stuff will change. So inside the double quotes, it's like it takes two passes at it, if you want to try to remember it that way. So a single... If well, it, but the, the place I got stuck on was the um, spaces in when I wrote more bacon and mm -hmm. it, yeah, as, as one of the uh, things you could choose from my menu. And if it was a double quotes, it would interpret that, that space and make that a separate name. So I would have a choice of more and a choice of bacon. A single and double would work the same there. The important thing is there be quotes. Oh, maybe that's what it was. Yeah, maybe there weren't quotes at all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, see, I didn't even remember that correctly. I, I, Practice. Quotes are going to be mysterious for life for me, I think. But okay, now I, like, now I like single ones and I'm never using backslashes. Got it. Inside format <laughs> strings, that's a good idea. Uh, remember that in a single okay. quote, dollar variable name does not expand, right? Because a single quote is literal. So if you type... If you have a variable called dollar $x, if you stick single quote, dollar $x, single quote, the output will be the dollar symbol and the X symbol. If you oh, do that in, the, in here, Bart. <laughs> I well, but that is the difference. 
You are Maybe getting Dorothy one. Will make me one. We are, we are, no, we are working towards a cheat sheet. Remember, that is my promised finale. My grand finale for all this bash stuff is a giant big cheat sheet for, well, oh, Frankie Oh, I did me. not know that. I don't know that you told us that. Okay, great, great. No, you already gave me great praise about the idea last time. So I like the fact that you don't remember you've praised me before. This is good. You get to do it again. Anyway, yes, that is where we are headed to a nice big cheat sheet, which is selfish of me because uh, I need one. <laughs> <laughs> and I figure if I need one, we all do. Okay, so where was I? Yes, okay, so that all works fine. So that's our escape sequences out of the way, plain text out of the way. Right, the meat, these format specification thingamabobs. So they start with the percentage symbol. So if you're using printf and you see a percentage symbol, that's what I'm going to call a placeholder. The official name is a format specification. And a format specification contains up to four parts. Actually, there's a fifth part I'm completely ignoring for this series. So remember I said this thing can do more than we're going to talk about. So we have the option of having up to four things after the percent. We can have zero or more flags. We can have a minimum width. We can have a period followed by a level of precision. We must have a type. So the types are... As far as we're concerned, the subset we care about are D for a whole number, which I think of as digits, right? So okay. 10 is a D. F for a floating point number, so 2.145. S for a string. And percent for a percent. Because we have the same problem <laughs> as we have with the backslashes, right? The percent means we're starting off a format spec. So what if I actually want to print out 100%? Right, but then I actually right. need to have percent percent. I'm going to have percent okay. D for the number, percent percent. Right? Okay. Okay. So the simplest format specs are just a percentage symbol and the letter D, F, or S. Right? All we're using is the, is the, the percent and the type. But we have these other three things which we can use when we need them. And I could explain them all up front, but I'm going to show you instead of tell you. Right? I'm going to show Good. you why we need them by having some simple stuff that's not nice, and then we'll make it nicer. So we're going to start with a very simple format string. Percentage D space percentage S space cost, the dollar symbol percentage F, new line character. Now in my show notes, I mentioned in giant big bold text, so I wouldn't forget to say it, and then I promptly forgot to say it, printf does not shove a new line character onto the end for you. This means that you can use five or six printf statements to make one line of output, which is convenient, because with echo, every time you do an echo, you get a new line, so you can't build your string up in pieces. Oh. But it does mean you have to remember that if you want a new line, you have to tell it, I would like a new line. <laughs> but I can see the value of that if, if it would get really hard to read if you just had one giant long printf statement. Exactly, exactly. So it, it okay. is actually very valuable to be able to break them apart. But I, I do often find myself with my bash prompt suddenly shoved off way to the side. It's like, oh, I forgot the slash end, didn't I? Okay, well, let's rewrite the code. and <laughs> You'll know right end. away. <laughs> You'll know right, exactly. You'll know right away. So uh, so then we, we have uh, three arguments after that. So five pancakes, 5.5. And what a prince Okay, is. so let, let's say it again, because okay. you said a whole bunch of words in between. Uh, in his string, he's got percent D mm -hmm. is his first, wait, I'm going to get the word correct, format specification. It's just percent D. Then he's got percent S, cost. And then he's got percent F, which is going to be one of those floating points. But he's put a dollar symbol in front of it, which will just should just be passed through as a dollar symbol. And then he gives himself a new line. And then he's got the three, what do we call those, arguments? Well, values? Uh, okay. Yeah. Sure, let's call them values. Uh, five pancakes, 5.55. 5. Yes, which prints out five pancakes cost dollar 5.550000. Okay, hmm. so the, the five took the percent D because it's, a, it's a, a digit, it's a whole number. And then you had to use a percent S to put in pancakes. So five pancakes, because it's a string, and then you wanted a floating point for how much it costs, so you put in uh, the dollar symbol and the floating point uh, ampersand F to get a 5.55000. Yeah, now, it decided that floating point numbers should have 
six, six decimal digits. places, six digits of precision. That's its default. Uh-huh. It just decided. I, I, I don't want six digits of precision. I want, I want two. So how do Not I control? Money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How do I control precision? Well, if we scroll back up, one of the four things that we can put in there is precision, which is period symbol followed by a number. So we oh, can I simply... Oh, I like that. That's good syntax. Yeah, so you're going to hate lots of other things, but value. that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's stick with what I like. Don't, don't, don't ruin my book. No, this here. one's good. This one, I, this one I actually remember. So let's update, our, let's update our format specifier so that we have, instead of just saying percent %f, we're going to make it percent period two %f. So if we do exactly okay. the same thing, but after uh, the last one, we now have percent period two F. Now we get five pancakes cost dollar five point five five, which is okay. much better. Great. So now let's do some bigger numbers. Let's break it again. So Earth diameter becomes equal to four zero zero seven five point zero one seven, which is the number of kilometers that the Earth is around its equator. I checked. <laughs> So let's print f that. So the first argument to print f is the giant big string the space earth space is space percent f km space around space the equator period slash n and then end my string. And then I'm just going to pass it one placeholder or one value which is dollar earth diameter. Which yeah, is going to call it out. a placeholder. You already aren't allowed to use that word. <laughs> yeah, okay. One one more argument which is the value that's going to get shoved into my placeholder. Ah, there's the okay. right words. Okay, I, right I order. think, I think for the audience, you don't need to keep saying the spaces because it's a little harder to to follow it. So it says the Earth is percent f, so that's going to be a uh, floating point number, is percent f km, and you can just smash it right together because the km is yeah. just going to pass right through uh, around the equator, and then you put a new line and you're shoving in the value as dollar Earth diameter, which you just finished defining in the previous line. Correct, which is going to output the Earth is 4.0 whatever to six decimal places kilometers around the equator. So now we have two problems. The precision is too high. And uh, where's the commas? How am I supposed to read this big wall of numbers? So first off, we actually don't care about the, you know, we're dealing with the size of the Earth. How's about zero decimal places? Well, you'd be happy to know that 0.0 just means lop them off. Don't care. That's a precision of okay. no decimal places, so that's easy enough to do. Great, so now we're down to 40075 km around the equator. That's still not right. We want our separators. Now, this broke my head for a bit because when you read the documentation on Wikipedia, it looks like the optional flag for the separator is the comma symbol, which would be nice. It's not. It's the single quote. Which is not nice. I imagine it as a floating comma. It's the only way my brain is ever going to store up in this the information. Air. Okay. It's an up in the air comma. Yeah, that helps. So if we go back up I... and we have a look, so we can have percentage symbol followed by optional flags. Ah, okay. So the optional flags go before the precision. So that means that it's percent single quote 0.2f. Sorry, 0.0f because we want our zero. Now, okay. this is where string interpolation gets in our way. Because if we use single quoted strings, then the single quote will end the string. So now we've got to use double quoted strings. So thank goodness we don't need a backslash. If you ever need a backslash and the comma separator, you have a mess. You then have to do all sorts of escaping and stuff. So this time I'm so changing I, to double I have a quotes. really annoying question. Go on. In, in uh, France, they use the comma for the decimal. Mm-hmm. So how would the, the French just have to use English syntax? No, nope. no, this is the magic. So the printf statement doesn't interpret it as insert a comma. It interprets it as insert a thousand separator. And it doesn't insert a precision oh. as insert a period. It inserts it as insert a decimal separator. So when you're oh, in so a French, French version French. of Mac OS, te- yes. If you're oh, in French bash, fabulous. it will do the French thing. Or if you're in Belgian bash, because the Belgians do the same as the French. That's localization. That's so fabulous. Yes. So you'll be happy. There you go. A little, little bit of happy joy. So if we now have our format string as a percent single quote period zero F, that will give us a floating point number with all of the decimal precision gone and the thousand separator. 
So finally, we get the Earth is 40,075 km around the equator, which I can tell you is 40,000, because now I can see that it's 40,000 and not a wall of numbers. <laughs> right, right, right. That looks, that's fun. Yeah. It's not that hard. Now that I can think of it as a floating comma, I'm okay. Yeah, it still makes me cranky. Why not a comma? I'm sure there was a really good reason somewhere, somehow. But, uh, it makes me cranky. Anyway, so the okay. next thing that you can do you can actually use printf to make tables on the terminal. So you've probably noticed that there are terminal commands that output tabular data. And they do that, they're probably written in C, so they're probably using the C version of printf, but they're doing it with printf because printf can take, and remember, so we have, if we scroll back up again, we have our four things, percentage sign, optional flags, optional minimum width, optional precision type. So the minimum width is the key to giving us spacing so that things line up correctly. Now it is a minimum width. If you say, I want this to be 10 wide and you give it 11 characters worth of stuff, it will not truncate it. It will go, well, it doesn't fit. So it does treat the width as a minimum. If you, if you say this is 10 wide and you give it 12, it will print 12. Okay. Am I making sense? So it, it's, yeah, it'll override the minimum you gave because you gave it, okay. Yeah, it will overrun, basically. So the official documentation just calls it width, and then it tells you that it will overflow. So I, in the show notes, called it minimum width, because a width that overflows is a minimum width. It's not a maximum width, right? Right. So by default, if you give something a width, obviously, if I say, I want you to print the string boo, a width of 10, well, boo is three letters, and I've said make it a width of 10. So then the question is, what do I do with the other seven? Do I have seven spaces and then the boo? Or do we have the boo and then the seven spaces? In other words, where do, where do I put the value in the, in the width I've just given it? And the answer is the default is that if you specify a width, everything gets right aligned. Not left aligned, right aligned and is padded with spaces. So seven spaces and then boo. If I say I want a width of 10 and I pass it the value boo. So it's right aligned, padded with spaces. So it's not, okay, if you said uh, the width was 10, is it 10 to the edge of the right align or up to, I'm, I'm losing where the, where the 10 is. So the 10 is the full, okay, so it is, there are, there will be 10 characters printed. And the last three, the last characters will be what you passed it. And anything it needs to pad, it will be padding before. So if you say, I want this to be 10 wide, then you give it four characters, it will print six spaces and then your four characters. By default. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay. Sorry, I was using Bart's example and testing that. Now I understand. I, I, I wish I'd use the number smaller than 20. Uh, I made you count a lot there. <laughs> so the fact that it's okay, right so aligned is interesting. Your example. Yeah. Okay, so in my example, I'm going to make a variable to hold our format string because we're going to use the same format string for multiple rows of text. So imagine if you're printing a table, you could end up using the same format a thousand times. Right, if you okay. have a thousand pieces of data to print into your table. So instead of copying and pasting a thousand times or whatever, you can save it as a variable because it's just the first argument. So I'm just going to save uh -huh. my format as the string percent 20 s space percent 8.28 period 2 f slash n. So that's okay, percent so 20 s. I, we, know, we know the first thing is the, uh, well, we got to have the percent. The second thing is the flags, but it looks like we don't have any. Correct. We're not doing any any uh, commas with apostrophes or anything. So you're saying 20. So that's the minimum width. And then you're going to have a string. Mm -hmm. And then you've got percent 8.2F, which means it's going to be eight characters, right justified. Mm -hmm. And it's going to, but it's going to be a, f a floating point with 0.2 precision followed by a new line. Perfect. 10 out of 10. Okay. Okay. So then in order to not muck up your terminal, I'm going to put, I use the semicolon to have two terminal commands on one line. So it's just a printf, semicolon, another printf. That's all that's going on here because otherwise when I copied and pasted, I had my terminal reappear and my table wasn't oh. pretty. 
So okay. it's printf, and then we are quoting our format string because our format string contains spaces. So it's printf space dollar row format. And then the okay. first argument is waffles. Wait, printf quote dollar row fo- format. Yes. And then our first value is waffles and our second value is 4.5 then we have our semicolon printf our row format again pancakes 5.4 and when it prints out we get a right justified pancakes followed by 4.50 and then a right just sorry waffles 4.50 pancakes 5.40 and on a terminal with fixed width font they line up perfectly and the first column is 20 wide, and the second column is 8 wide. Um, I think it's 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, Well, there's five, a space, six, seven, there's a space eight, between nine. the two columns. So there should be, it should... Yeah, why is there a space? Because the percent 8 is not... I, I, I intentionally put a space between the S and the percent 8. If I wanted there not to be a space, I would bash them together. No, you can't do that. Oh, of course you can. Wait a minute. So right now it says percent twenty s space percent eight point two f. You're saying mm-hmm. you would write percent twenty s percent eight point two f. Yes. That spa- oh, because that space is just it's just a string character being passed through. It's just plain text. Oh, I'm glad I counted because that could matter. Now huh. a lot. Something okay. you will see done a lot is the pipe symbol used to separate your columns. Oh. Because then you really do get a table. And then if you use dashes for some horizontal rows, a few echo oh, statements oh, oh, with pi- dashes. So, so not piping. Okay, I was yeah. a little worried there that I was going to be piping one of these format strings into the other. Or it's not a format string. One of these, uh, shoot. Well, the whole thing is a format string, right? So you could say you No, could... but that, that's not what I meant. Uh, I thought we were going to be piping one format specification into another format specification, no, but no, no. it's just a string at this point. It's it is just the a string. character pipe. With the, yeah, precisely, okay. precisely, precisely. Context is everything. Okay. Context is king. Yeah. So huh. that that really right. So that's what it's doing by default. But that's not necessarily what you want for your default. So how about we left align our descriptions? The flag for left align, and I have no idea how you're going to remember this, it's minus. So if we change our row format to be percent minus 20s, and then space dollar symbol percent 8.2f. So I've added it in the dollar symbol just because I probably should have done that on the first one now that I think about it. But anyway, there we go. So I got cleverer next time. So... The minus now means that our waffles and pancakes are going to be l- left aligned inside their 20 wide space. So now when we print it out, we get waffles, space, 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 dollar sign. And then after the dollar sign, the eight width of the floating point begins. And then we have our pancakes, dollar sign, and then the eight width of that one begins. Okay. Um... And it notice it is eight in total, so the period counts as a character. If it was a yes. negative number, it would count as well, right? So it really is a very dumb eight characters. It's not like eight digits to the right of the period. It's not. It doesn't. It's not. In, it's not thinking numbers. It's just thinking characters, right? It's just there is room here for eight things to go on the screen. So eight things. I wouldn't call that here. dumb at all. That you you require that when you're aligning things that that a, a period should be a character. That's Takes fair. up the space. Yeah. Fair. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Yeah, so minus, I, I can kind of feel it. 20 means shift it over to the right, but if you want to shift to the left, you got to go backwards. Minus 20, maybe. If it it's works. Not horrible. I need a money. It's not like a get... floating comma for crying out loud, Bart. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that works for you. The other thing you sometimes want to do with numeric data is instead of padding it with spaces, you might want to pad it with zeros. Because sometimes you actually do want to have, like, if you're building up file mm-hmm. names, you might want to have 001, 002, or whatever. So you yeah. can do that with the flag zero. Hmm. That one actually does make sense. So if we have the row format percent zero three D, the first zero is the flag because the width has to be one or more. So it w- so a zero will never be interpreted as a width because a zero is the flag. Widths are one two three four five six seven See, eight. 
that bothers me a little bit. But. I know it looks a bit weird, doesn't it? But it does yeah. work because if we print out uh, one twenty and three hundred, we get them perfectly lined up as zero zero one zero two zero and three zero zero. And you did that with percent zero three, three. D. Yes. So it's a digit. It's going to be three wide. You could have made it five wide. I could have, and then it would have had two more zeros padded in front of each one. Wait, why? Because if you say five and we're padding with zeros, then there will be... Oh, you're telling me zero three is saying how many zeros to pad with? No. No, it's just... Zero means pad with enough. zeros. Three means how wide. So zero width five... Width is not, not how many digits you have. Width is how wide the column is. We just finished saying that. Correct. And instead of padding with spaces, we're padding with zeros. Uh, <laughs> I don't like this at all. So is it minus, how do I make it be uh, a width of 20 and right justified? It, then you would just say uh, zero, two, zero. zero th and if you want to right justified is what you get by default, so. No, okay. Wait a minute, but I, I think I don't understand. So it says percent zero three D. You're yes. saying the zero says we're going to pad with zeros and we're going to make it three characters wide. Correct. Not the column, not the column width, but the, the number will be three digits. The placeholder shall hold three characters on the screen and the... There's no that, such thing as a placeholder. That's not a word, that's not a word we're allowed to use, The right? format spec but, shall be three characters wide. The output from the format spec... Width. But th that's not minimum width. Yes, it is. But we said minimum width was the width of the column, not of the number of digits in what you're looking at. Those Maybe it's are different with numbers? No, uh, there are exactly three characters. Zero, zero, one, that is exactly three. The width is three. The only if, thing that's changed is that the spaces are now zeros. If you take the zero out, right, it would be space, space, one, space, two, zero, three, zero, zero. Okay. So but how do I, let's, what would the syntax be to make it be right justified? We want it, it we is want right the justified. column width, we want the column width to be, to be 20. Okay. So, oh, you're saying that in order to have these, this, this padding of zeros, they have to be part of the width. Okay, so when you make something 20 wide, the default is we fill in the gap with spaces. The zero just means mm -hmm. don't fill in with spaces, fill in with zeros. Okay, so that's, that's different than just saying there's a leading zero in the number. These aren't really numbers. These are padded places to make up the width. That's a, that's a little different. I was thinking a lot of times you want numbers to, to, you know, to look correct, to have the same number of digits. Uh, but in this case, they also define the width. It's a little, yes. it's just a little subtlety. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I understand it now. I don't like it, but I, I understand it. <laughs> now, if you mix positive and negative numbers, things can get out of alignment again. So what do you do if you have a mixture of minus and positive numbers? Well, one of the things you can do is explicitly prefix the positive numbers with a plus. I... I think that looks ugly, but I'm sure there's a reason. I'm sure there are places where you would want to do that. So you can have the flag plus to say prefix my positive numbers with pluses. So then if you do that, so if you say percent plus D, and then you ask it to print out minus one, zero, one, one, you get minus one plus zero plus one. The plus zero Ooh, I don't might like irritate that. the plus other zero. Jill. The, the other Jill <laughs> would get cranky at the plus zero, but anyway. Um, or a nicer solution might be to pad with spaces. So that a positive Wait, it's number. It's not the other Jill. It's still Jill of Kent. It's the it's the same Jill. Oh, so it is. Yes. Apologies, Jill. <laughs> Keep our Jills correct. <laughs> Something that's more practical to want to do is just to have a space in front of the positive numbers so that they line so up. So they line up. Yeah. Okay. And you can do that with the um, flag. Oh, you're gonna love this. You can use the space as a flag. Oh, come on. <laughs> I know. So percent space means percent space D means I want the digit 
and the flag is the space. And it looks like you're separating it, but it's not. The percent space D is all, because it goes as far as the type, which is D. It makes my head hurt. And it knows not to apply that space to the minus. Yes, because that's what the, yeah, that's what the syntax, so that's the meaning of the flag is pad positive numbers with a space. When you see your command and you see the output right afterwards, it makes sense at that instant in time. But if I was looking at that without your output, I'd be going, what? My advice when using printf in your own code is to comment it generously so that future you (laughs) knows what you're doing. And if you're going to read someone else's code that uses printf, have the, have the manual open. Just, just have the docs open. You're going to need them. <laughs> I promise you, you will need them because you'll be looking at it going, percent space, what, 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 what? Because you can have as many flags as you like. As many flags as make sense, you can shove them all together. So as a final example, we have the wonderful format percent space single quote period 2f. Right, so percent space means I want to prefix my negative numbers with a space. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, sure, I've just lost my place in the show notes. What a terrible time. Uh, right. The single quote means I want thousand separators. The point mm-hmm. two means I want a decimal precision of two. And the F means floating point. So if I run that with minus one, two, three, four, point five, six, seven, eight, and nine, eight, seven, six, point five, four, three, two. I get minus 1, 324.57. So I've truncated by 2. I have my comma. And on the next line, I have space 9, 8765.54. Again, truncated to two decimal places with a space and my comma. Not, Not truncated, rounded. Yes, fair. Red, and red. and also, also rounded down. So it was one, two, three, four. It was negative one, two, three, four dot five, six, seven, eight. So they rounded to a smaller number. They rounded down. They went in the down negative uh, direction. Yes. And actually the five, seven was rounded as well in the upward direction. That's the one I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm saying it went, it went more negative. That, oh, that is sorry, important yes, 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 because yes, yes, yes. In, in my, in my time, uh, time adder application, that threw me because it didn't uh, round doesn't round down in oh. uh, JavaScript. So oh. it was getting bigger. It was like, wait, what? Ooh. That took me a long time to find that one. Oh, that is weird. Yeah, I had to I do is. some jiggery pokery to fix it. I hope I said that correctly, but it was one way or the other. It was doing it, it, it the opposite of what I thought it should. Interesting. Bad interesting, yeah. but interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then one final little this tip. Is... So the precision operator obviously makes sense with decibel numbers. And I did tell you that you specify a minimum width. What if you actually need to make some text not break out? What if you want your text not to smash through? You use the precision operator to truncate strings. So if you, yeah. So if you wow. want to have a string be exactly three characters, you would say 3.3s. 3.3s. So a a minimum length of of three, three. and and then a precision of three, which means if it's longer than three, chop it off, and that will give you exactly three. That's so annoying because now you're you're taking decimal <laughs> syntax and, and applying it to strings. To strings. Wow. But that so is this how it is works. a highly efficient language we're working with, as you said. It's information dense. There are very few characters in these format specs, but there's a lot of meaning in those very few characters. Like a regular yeah. expression, it says a lot with very little, which is powerful. And very confusing when it's other people's code. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, th- those uh, those three letters and those digits, they're, they're doing a lot of work. Each they one of really them. are doing a lot of work. So the final example in the show notes, we have uh, percent minus 3.3s space percent 2d. And we're giving it Monday 5, Tuesday 11. And that ends up printing out a nice little table of M-O-N space 5. Q11, and it's all nicely aligned. The first row left aligned, not that it really matters when you truncate it, um, and the second right aligned. As I say, you can get so carried away with this. 
so carried away with this. Usually, to be honest, the way the way it normally works in real world is you start with just percent %S and percent %D or percent %F. And then you run your script and it won't look right. And then you go, OK, what do I need to change? And then you'll start to throw in your flags and your precision until you get what you want. That is generally how I would advise doing it. Oh, you're on mute, Alison. I am. I took a drink of my water. My ice makes noise. Um, one of the things I did was uh, to help with this was I used my my screenshot tool that I'm testing right now called Shotter to take a screenshot of the syntax that you gave us. So I've had it floating. So no matter how much I <laughs> scrolled through the show notes, I keep going, okay, flags are first, then min width, then precision, then type. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And that is, I mean, that is it. So final thoughts, just... Jill's wonderful message serves as a fantastic reminder that the community drive this series. And the, 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 the further we've gotten into it, the more into the hundreds we've gotten, the more the community is affecting the flow of things, right? The things the community find interesting, I spend extra time on. When the community mm -hmm. get confused about something, I loop back. And when the community have a great idea, I will very often take it on board, as this entire episode took a whole different turn than what I planned because of Jill's message. So potfeet.com forward slash slack is where you can hang out and send me messages of your own or Alison. Very good. Lots Very of people good. in there having great fun. <laughs> yeah. Now, the, the programming by stealth uh, uh, channel is probably the most active other than delete me where we just goof around. <laughs> we throw <laughs> random stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then the yeah. second thing I'm hoping you appreciate is just how powerful printf is. It really is. It makes it possible to write some amazing outputs to the terminal. And like Perl's regular expression syntax is a digital life skill, these percentage symbol things, they show up all over the place. Now that you know about them, look out for them. And just like when you buy your first EV, you'll suddenly see EVs everywhere. Once you know these percent symbols, you're going to start seeing them all over the place, including in security alerts for Apple routers from time to time. So anyway, that is, <laughs> that is hopefully a new life skill. And I'm going to end with a challenge. So I had, to, I had to think long and hard about this and I've teleported us back in time a bit. We're going to set our menu aside and way early in our bash adventure, we did loops and the tradition for making loops and setting homework is printing an X times table. Well, mm -hmm. tabular data sounds like something that maybe we could have some X times data in. So I would like you to write a new shell script for printing out a nicely formatted multiplication table. I would like your script to require one argument, which is going to be the number whose table we print out. By default, I would like you to print to multiply that number by one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 10. I would then like you to accept two named optional flags minus lowercase m for a different minimum. So instead of it being from one to something, be minus m to something. And an uppercase m for a maximum, because minimum and maximum start with the same bloody letter. So I figured minus m minus m. Uh, so minus lowercase <laughs> minus uppercase to replace the 10 for the uppercase, or for the upper limit. So that way you can make your table go from, you know, minus four to five million or whatever you like. Then as some bonus credit, I would, if you have the time and the inclination, if and only if standard out is connected to a terminal, I would like you to send your output through less. Oh, there it is. There it is. So if you do the 100 times tables from minus 1000 to plus 1000, I think we should have that with a space to go page to page. <laughs> okay. So there we go. You get to practice everything we talked about, I hope. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like a fun one. Now, I assume we're allowed to go use our previous homework as a starting point. Oh, yes, I certainly will be. <laughs> <laughs> I like that assignment. I was good at that one. I, I didn't do so good this week, but uh, I'll, I'll be back in it. I, I think this will be a lot of fun. This looks, uh, I like this alignment stuff. You know, I like tables. I like I organization. The more I wrote these show notes, the more I thought, Alison's going to like this one. <laughs> I also knew you were going to hate some of the syntax, so I, I preemptively sort of nipped it in the bud, but I knew you wouldn't like things like the single quote, because I don't like it. It's silly. Right, right. But I didn't get to design it, I just have to tell you. Right, well that is it, so until next time, lots of happy computing.
If you learn as much from BART each week as I do, I'd like you to go over to lets-talk.ie and press one of the buttons over there to help support him. He does 98% of the work here. I'm just the stooge that listens to him and asks the dumb questions. If you go over to lets-talk.ie, you can support him on Patreon, you can donate via PayPal, or you can use one of his referral links. I really hope you'll go over and help him out. In the meantime, you can contact me at Podfeet or check out all of the shows we do over there over at podfeet.com. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.